Faraway Wanderers Chapter 67, The Parting of Ways It turned out that the pretty youth wasn't dead yet. Zhang Chengling wasn't used to hurting people, after all. Though he did his best to be ruthless, he had hesitated in the end. Still, the gash he had cleaved down his opponent's front was both long and deep. Blood surged out of it with a gurgling sound. The head scorpion gave an odd chuckle as he eyed Zhang Chengling. Some people are just immensely lucky, aren't they, he muttered. My good boy, your future will doubtless be bright. He then bent down to examine the pretty youth who was twitching on the ground. As he stared back at his owner, the fallen young man tried to struggle. The head scorpion pinched him by the chin. What a shame, he said, shaking his head. The face is ruined. With that, he tightened his grip, and the youth's head lolled at an unnatural angle. He had strangled him dead. The head scorpion didn't even spare the corpse a single glance. Nodding to the few of them, he turned and left, bringing his remaining underlings. Still holding onto his bloodied sword, Zhang Chengling stood in the middle of the courtyard and trembled all over. Cao Waining approached him with caution. He took back his weapon, wiped it clean, cast a nervous glance at the corpse on the ground, and patted Zhang Chengling on the shoulder. This we are all rather surprised by this actually. That man doesn't seem to be of decent sort so maybe what he said isn't true at all. He glanced back as though looking for support, but Gao Xiaolian was still frozen in shock, Gu Xiang seemed deep in thought, and the other two, clearly had the airs of people who knew all along. Cao Waining thought back to Zhang Zisha's reply to Wen Kexing's questions that day when Gao Xiaolian had recounted her encounters almost all those who know what happened had died, leaving only one person. The winners and the losers are now evident. The winners and the losers are, were evident. Cao Waining couldn't help a discreet shiver. So, the two men already knew back then. They already. Zhang Chengling whipped around. Shifu, he said. I remembered what the man in black who questioned my father looked like. Just now, I. I. He twisted his head back gaze falling on the pretty youth's corpse. His Adam's apple bobbed up and down whilst his frame shook yet harder. He was, about that tall, Zhang Chengling stammered, holding up his hand while rising slightly on the balls of his feet. His shoulders were very broad, and one of his legs, one of his legs was Lame. Though it wasn't apparent at first, and I spotted it only when he broke into a run to chase after us. He pointed at the fallen youth. Just like him that man, he was the one who wounded Uncle Li. He, he. Gu Xiang let out a small, surprised oh. Before clamping her hand over her mouth. Her eyes that were already uncommonly large widened to the point of popping out of their sockets as if she had just heard the scariest of news. When Kexing cast her a look before he reached out his hand that wasn't marred with gore, to pat Zhang Chengling on the head. It's all right. I know, he said in a soft voice whilst nodding. When Kexing lifted his head and gazed at the night then, staring at a place far away as a strange smile spread across his lips. There was a hint of mockery in that smile, but it was yet more serene, laced with a hard-to-describe sense of relief. It made him look like an exhausted traveler who, after trudging a hundred mountains and crossing a thousand rivers, could finally glimpse upon the true face of destiny. Gu Xiang slowly put her hand down. Master, she said softly. Wen Kexing held up his palm to stop her from speaking further. You are a maiden that has been married off, like water that has been thrown out of the door. From now on, this matter has nothing to do with you. Tomorrow, you shall go and find Yebai as you are supposed to do. Of course, I won't withhold your dowry. You needn't go back to that place ever again. Zhang Chengling wished he were stronger. He had decided he should be a real man and soldier forth bravely, that he should protect the people he wanted to protect, and eradicate the people who ought to be eradicated, without feeling fear, and without shrinking from his task no matter what reality threw his way. But despite his resolve, he was unable to hold back the tears that rolled down his face in great beads. 
he felt as though he had turned back to that weak, helpless child who could not accomplish anything. Because bad people had massacred his entire family, he had applied himself to learning Kung Fu. So, he would become strong. So he would become capable of defending his friends and family in the future. And perhaps, one day, kill the bad people to avenge the dead. But turns out, the bad people was Uncle Zhao. Before he had closed his eyes for good, Zhang Qingling's own father had grasped onto Uncle Li's hand and made the old fisher promise he'd take Zhang Chengling to that man. Then, during the cold night at the derelict temple, Uncle Li had, in turn, clutched his shifu in his dying grip, to make him escort Zhang Chengling to that man's home. Uncle Zhao was the person who had stayed by his side day and night during his darkest hours. He was the person who, in front of every hero under the heavens, had vowed with reddened eyes that justice for the Zhang family would be served. He was. The world was too cruel and the human heart too treacherous. If even the people who were closest and safest to him couldn't be trusted, was there anyone or anything on which he could rely on this earth? When Kexing heaved a faint sigh. He averted his eyes and headed back. Zhou Zishu, however, lingered. He beckoned at Zhang Cheng Ling. Brat? Come here. Zhang Chengling mopped his face energetically, but his vision instantly blurred again. He knew Zhou Zishu abhorred seeing him ball, so he said in between sniffles, Shi Shifu. I I don't mean to cry. I'm just. I'm just. I'll be fine in a moment. Zhou Zishu heaved a sigh. Uncharacteristically, he said nothing. Instead, he stretched out his hand to draw Zhang Chengling into a hug. Because he was only dressed in a thin cloak hastily thrown over his inner garment, the heat of Zhou Zishu's body readily seeped through his clothes. And in that instant, as he buried his entire face into his Shifu's chest, Zhang Chengling felt as though he was leaning against a mountain that would never falter. The long-standing ties of polite society may be no more than mutual lies, but a chance encounter could turn into a lasting bond. Cao Waining took Gu Xiang by the hand and retired quietly. Gao Xiaolian heaved a deep sigh, she also headed back looking pensive. Only the teacher and the disciple were left in the courtyard. As the great shaman peered at them from his window, he couldn't help but wonder in a quiet voice, is that man, really the Lord Manor Zhou we knew? Since when has he become so? Lord Seventh chuckled though it was unclear whether he was answering the great shaman or talking to himself, he said, has he ever been any different? He was already like that with Liang Juxiao back then. Though he just had to put on the face of an old grouch at all times, he'd actually plan out everything for him on the quiet. It's a shame the lad never appreciated his effort. The great shaman twisted around to look at his companion. In the unlit room, Lord Seventh's face was hidden in the dark with the moonlight kissing only a sliver of his features. He was so beautiful like that, he didn't seem human. If you were to say that he is a good man, of great benevolence and virtue, Lord Seventh went on, I'm quite afraid he wouldn't admit to it himself. But if you were to say he's a scumbag. Of all the terrible deeds he did commit, not one was executed out of selfish desire, nor has he benefited from them. All of a sudden, Lord Seventh turned around to fetch something. Then, with an imperceptible sigh, he pushed the door open and headed out. He made his way into the courtyard in long strides and tossed the object in his hand into Zhang Chengling's arms. The boy fumbled to catch it. He froze in shock when he saw what he had just received, it was a sword made of dark metal. Only after his shifu gave him a nod, did he dare draw it out of its scabbard. The blade of the weapon was uncommonly broad, it was at least double the width of Cao Waning's sword. Neither polished nor lustrous, its design had rather a primitive character that was only accentuated by its dull burnish. The edges looked fearsome, though, they had obviously been quenched with boundless carnage in mind. And the whole thing felt hefty in the hands as it weighed twice or thrice the poundage of any ordinary sword. Two words were engraved near the hilt, Great Famine. A subordinate gave it to me as a gift, Lord Seventh said. Something for me to play with in my spare time. It's impressive enough a piece, 
but my swordsmanship was never good, so it's useless in my hands. I find it unwieldy anyway too heavy. You take it. Wah! Zhang Chengling uttered. His eyes were still red from crying and he was at a loss how to react. Good swords should go with heroic men, even if it's future heroic men, Lord Seventh went on. Which counts me out in this lifetime, I'll remain a rich idler at best. That's why I'm giving it to you. Just try to live up to it. Our deepest gratitude to Lord Seventh, Zhou Zisha said in a solemn voice. Lord Seventh gave a chuckle. He cast Zhou Zishu a sidelong glance, and said in a shrewd tone, Our friendship has lasted some years now. We've fought together, gambled with our lives together. So how come you're all fun and games with everyone else, but always turn into a stately boar whenever you're with me? Zhou Zishu gave a start. Lord Seventh waved his hand, and turned to leave. Zishu, he said over his shoulder. I'm no longer the Prince of Nanning and you're no longer Lord Zhou. For such a clever man, haven't you got it by now? Zhou Zisha was silent for a moment before his expression relaxed. It's true I dare not joke around carelessly, he called out with a sudden grin. But that's only because Lord Seventh is so exquisitely handsome, he could put flowers and the moon to shame, and I fear the sour grape I've got at home would die of jealousy. Lord Seventh faltered in his steps. Though he didn't take offense, his expression was between laughter and tears when he glanced back. Exasperated, he shook his head before ducking inside. Zhou Zisha didn't sleep that night. He taught Zhang Chengling a new sword pattern. With eyes still swollen, the boy watched him conscientiously. Zhang Chengling was as slow to learn as before. He still needed to have every stance demonstrated to him several times whilst others would have got it on the first try. He also asked an unending series of questions each time, before finally progressing on to the next move. At the end of the lesson, the boy rummaged out a brush and a stack of paper to draw every stance Zhou Zishu had demonstrated labeling each sketch with the corresponding mantra and took some messy notes. In fact, he was so thorough, he may as well have copied down every word that came out of Zhou Zishu's mouth. Whatever are you drawing these for? Zhou Zishu asked. Why don't you just go back and practice? Zhang Chengling blushed. Shifu, he mumbled, it's because I'm still having trouble with the pattern you taught me last time. I... I know that I'm stupid, so I gave myself a set of rules. I have to practice every stance 10,000 times before starting on the next one. And then, I go over everything as many times as I can, every morning, I wake up early to... Rag. Remembering that Zhou Zisha did not like his constant recitation of mantra, he halted and spoke no more. Carefully, he lifted his head to peek at Zhou Zishu and stuck out his tongue sheepishly. Zhou Zishu looked back at him with a conflicted expression on his face. As the sayings went, when one advanced with both feet firmly planted on the ground, neither in haste, nor with impatience, great intelligence may appear as stupidity and great skill may seem to be clumsiness. The head scorpion said Zhang Chengling was lucky, but Zhou Zisha felt that, in truth, he was the lucky one for having chanced upon such a remarkable student. He patted the boy on the shoulder. You may go tomorrow. Remember to do only what you can. And don't, fail the sword Lord Seventh gave you. The next day, Gu Xiang, Cao Waining, Gao Xiaolian, and Zhang Chengling set off together. They had decided to search for Ye Bai on one hand, and covertly track down Zhao Jing and his associates at the same time. Indeed, Cao Waining was worried about Qing Feng Sword Sect. Gao Xiaolian and Zhang Chengling wanted to find out the truth. Gao Chong had been one of the holders of the realm's command so Ye Bai wasn't likely to stand by idly after what happened to Gao Chong. They hoped to cross paths with him while conducting their investigation. After seeing off the four rowdy children, Zhou Zisha retired to his room, prepared to take a rest. He pushed the door open to the sight of Wen Kexing waiting for him. Wen Kexing sat on the windowsill with one leg folded up and the other dangling about. Both of his hands were crossed over his knee. When Zhou Zisha walked in, he looked up and smiled. 
Asu, I'm leaving too, he said. Josisha was silent for a moment before he asked, back to Fenja Mountain. When Kexing nodded. I've been meandering around for long enough. I've met almost all the people and almost all the sights that I've never encountered in my life before. It's time I went back to sort out the serious stuff. Asu. He trailed off, looking as though he wanted to say something but didn't know where to begin. After clawing through his hair a few times, he finally blurted out, Do, recuperate properly. And don't you cheat on me. I'll catch up with you at Chungming Mountain later on. In case I... Zhou Zisha took out his wine flask and swayed it in his hand. He averted his eyes from Wen Kexing as he poured out a cup. I get it, he said, interrupting the other man. Go on. Get lost. Don't die. Wen Kexing gave a soundless chuckle. He uttered, take care, and was gone in the next instant. The breeze rustled against the empty window, as if no one had ever sat there. Zhou Zisha downed his cup of wine in one gulp. End chapter Far Away Wanderers Chapter 68, Letting Go After walking for a stretch of time, Cao Waning realized that Gu Xiang was being quiet. She had been, ever since that scene of turmoil from the start of the night. Gao Xiaolian, a reserved young woman, was not especially familiar with them, and was just fine with not speaking on her own initiative, merely following behind them distantly while she carefully helped Zhang Chengling with leading the reins, the young man was holding his new great famine sword in his arms while dozing off on the horse's back. His drool was flowing onto its neck, dampening its hair and causing the little horse to shake its head the whole time. Cao Waning gathered in close to Gu Xiang, leaned down, then tilted his head to take a careful measure of her expression. What's wrong? he asked. Did you not sleep well, either? She looked at him listlessly, then lowered her head, the spitting image of a young wife. That only frightened him, though. Believing that she had eaten something spoiled, he quickly reached out to feel her forehead, thinking to himself, this woman that always jumps around and all about is being very docile, she couldn't have fallen ill, right? She leaned backwards flung his hand away, then turned to look back at the pair that was a good bit away from them. It's a, you've always thought that honesty was a bit foolish, and normally, three kicks wouldn't get a fuss out of you. What anyone else said would just be whatever, she said, sullen. How did someone that's apparently never grown a brain end up turning into a major devil that plots behind everyone's backs? He contemplated on her words for some time, then made a weird face. Ah Xiang, have you, misunderstood something about Xiao Zhang? Gu Xiang went silent for a short moment. You who is surnamed Cao, she started menacingly, can go ahead and die. She then raised her hand and went to hit him. Cao Waning smiled mischievously as he dodged her. Ah, don't. Won't you be a widow if I die? To be widowed at a young age would be very pitiful. After thinking about that, she felt it to be true, she still didn't yet hold the two and a half streets of dowry her master had promised, so doing this would be a loss. Glaring at Cao Waning, she took her raised hand back, deciding to fight with language, not fists. She knew herself to not be any sort of highly capable. Many times, she couldn't understand what her master was saying, simply following beside him in ignorance occasionally flapping her trap to entertain him in addition to her everyday life of attending to him. She, and he, and they, were not people going the same path. She couldn't be considered a flower of considerate words, nor a close confidant of rosy cheeks. Like a child, she had only a smidgen of deviousness and cunning, where she could approach benefits whilst shunning disadvantages. Even though all the people she had seen below Fenja Mountain had been nothing good, her master had been there, and none of them dare to entertain the idea of hurting her. Thus, amazingly her naivete has been preserved. She wasn't great at determining people's intentions, and in spite of knowing what evil was, she had no idea what genuine evil looked like. Lao Meng, the ghost of impermanence, 
had been wearing clothes like an old farmer would at Lake Tai when she had temporarily nabbed him. He had dug a hole in the ground to drag those two sorry-looking men out of it, and then, because of one word from their master, he specifically sought out the clothes of a butcher to wear, smiling happily at everyone. She had even heard people talking behind his back, saying that he was a dog raised by their master. Even dogs would have a bit of a dog's temper, but he didn't even have one of those. Did he steal the key? Did he betray Ghost Valley? Where was the hanged ghost, Shui Fang? There had been a fake Shui Fang, back when the Zhang family had been silenced. Was Lao Meng the impersonator? Starting from that point on, had Lao Meng been colluding with that Zhao Jing? Noticing that her brows were still furrowed, Cao Waning attempted to ease her worries. Truthfully, I understood a bit of what Brother Zhou and the rest had said yesterday. Blinking her big, apricot pit-like eyes, she looked up at him. Once glanced at him in that way, he practically emanated a heroic aura, like he could do anything, and suddenly felt himself to truly be a purely manly man. A purely manly man who, for the sake of consoling his lady when she was upset, would suffer her blows whenever she was angry, and stand up to give her a thorough analysis whenever she didn't understand something. I heard them say lapis armor and key, he said. They evidently want to get what's in the armor. Finding the five pieces of it alone isn't enough, as it still requires a key, which is in the hands of that limping villain Xiao Zhang had spoken of. At the start, this villain and Zhao Jing were in the same side, so they set out together to do evil and steal the other pieces. Zhao Jing murdered Patriarch Shen, framed Hero Gao for it, then obtained all of them, now, one has the armor, while one has the key, thus dividing the loot unequally, and making them start to fight. Gu Xiang pondered this, then nodded. That seems to be the situation. But who is the one wanting to kill Zhang Chengling then? Think about it. Xiao Zhang saw the villain that has been hiding all this time. Even if he had forgotten it for a time, that villain still feared that he would remember, then unveil his identity, so he hired people to hunt him down, ah, yes, Zhao Jing must have known about this, else he wouldn't have allowed brother Zhou and them to bring Xiao Zhang away amidst such a mess. Once he was brought away, he then wouldn't be able to set about killing him so easily but why is that Ghost Valley crook afraid of having his identity exposed? It took me half a night of thinking before I understood, he's likely scared of the people from the Ghost Valley discovering that he's a traitor, then killing him. She looked at him in adoration, thinking to herself that his theory was like a blind cat bumping into a dead mouse. Upon seeing her expression, he felt even more like he was walking on air waving his hand in false humility. I'm just randomly guessing, that's all. Ahem. Let's not worry over stuff like fools, we'll go expose Zhao Jing's plot, look for Hero Yat, then go back to live a good life, just you and me. Your Shifu disdains that I have no father or mother, and am maiden of questionable background, she pointed out. What if he doesn't allow it? Cao Waning made another big hand wave. Then you'll abduct me, and we'll elope. Hey! Am I that desperate? She fumed. He thought some more. Then I'll pretend to switch roles to a flower stealer, abduct you, and we'll elope. Upon deliberation, she believed that that was a terrible idea, but also just good enough. She thus nodded, satisfied, and reached out her tiny hand to hook around Cao Wanings. They rode side by side which was simply sickeningly sweet. In full contentment, Cao Waning thought, so, this is what it is to have a wife, having one is really nice. She's soft, smells good, and when she leans against me, even my heart melts after her. She smiles at me, and I immediately get dizzy. She's someone who will know when I'm feeling hot or cold, or will make up the bed, in the future, will build a little house with a little courtyard, have a couple chubby little kids, and I'll hear her voice sharply calling for me to come home for dinner. The more he think about it, the more beautiful those thoughts became, until his desire to spout poetry was overwhelming. Golden Wind and Jadeite do meet once, superior to the countless meetings of the mortal realm, he crisply recited. 
In the heavens, I wish for us to be birds of the same feather. On earth, I wish for us to be conjoined trees. Those people scheming this and scheming that the day long, struggling to make others die while living themselves, what was the point of it? Practicing exceptional, divine arts, being number one in the realm through a thousand autumns and innumerable generations, what was the point of that? They would still be old bachelors all their lives, never getting wives. C.A.O. Waning vaguely felt pity to all them. When Lord Seventh and the great shaman returned carrying a sum of medical supplies, they caught sight of Joe Zisha sitting in the courtyard, whittling a flute. His craftsmanship was nothing great, and he was using materials from his surroundings, even having ruined a few prior, all sounds they made muted when played and producing a field's worth of wood dust. As Lord Seventh drew near, he discovered that his latest flute had since taken shape. The great shaman nodded at Joe's issue, then turned and went in the house, not having anything to say to him. Lord Seventh conversely sat down at the side. What are you doing? Cultivating myself physically and spiritually, Joe's issue answered lazily. He put his carved flute up to his mouth, then blew, finally getting it to make sound. When others played the flute, it was a heavenly sound that entered the clouds, but when he played it, it was a demonic noise that pierced the ears, sometimes shrill, sometimes hoarse, and not a single note in tune regardless, crowing and twittering. This was clearly not self-cultivation it was a cultivation of any listener's endurance. Covering his ears, Lord Seventh took the carving knife and wood piece out of his hands. His fingers were extraordinarily nimble. In just a few motions, the flute was fully shaped. It didn't look any different from Joe Zisha's craft at a surface glance, but after the latter took it back, brought it to his lips, and then tested it out, the change was audible. He played out a folk song from the Wildlands, which was actually quite nice. At the end of it, he put the flute down with a smile. You're worthy of having been the number one capital dandy that could pick up and put down anything from poetry, to songs, to dining, drinking, hustling, and gambling. All that playing around gained you a couple of tricks. Lord Seventh grinned. He left. The other nodded. You didn't go with him, Lord Seventh Press. I wanted to, of course, but there's too much of a mess on their end. One praying mantis is hunting a cicada while having a hundred siskins behind it. I'll wait a little then go take an assessment. I'll go fish him up when the time is right, Joe Zisher replied. You'll only fish him up? Nothing else. Lord Seventh gave him a look. If he was Juxiao, you wouldn't be so unworried. Joe Zisha smiled, shaking his head. How could he be compared to Juxiao? He was just a Bart, while he, knows what he needs to do. I can't meddle in his affairs, either. He has to solve them by himself. As he talked, he stood up to stretch out his muscles. Sticking the short flute Lord Seventh had carved and his hip flask both into his belt, he turned away. Thanks you for the flute if I haven't guessed wrong, that head scorpion is the first siskin. I'll go out, grab a flower engraved pot, and get ready to take flight with him. Lord Seventh lifted his head to look at him. Joe Zisha's back was against the light. The look on his face was unclear, yet his cheeks appeared to be bordered with gold. Go quick and come back quick, he thus said with a smile. Don't neglect your healing time. Joe Zisha waved, then strode out. The other lowered his head, whittled out another little flute, blew the sawdust away, then put it up to his lips, as if to send him off. That clear, rich sound echoed like the rousing tone of the wind, its trailing notes gently flowing. Despite this being no more than a crude flute made of weeds, it allowed him to play like the natural grace of a seeming flourishing age with the splendorous noise was coming out of it. What a shame that before the song's end, the flute petered out, and Joe Zisha's figure had long since vanished. Lord Seventh lowered his eyes, chuckled, and tossed the flute to the side. Standing and gathering up his sleeves, he then turned to head inside. Long ago, when Joe Zishu and he had still been in the capital, when he was still that Prince Nanning who would get a hundred answers for his every call, 
and when Zhou Zixia was still the head of Tian Zhuang that warped and weaved in the dark, he had believed that the two of them were the same type of person. Yet, coming to this day, he realized that they weren't the same at all. He had never had the man's same kind of Jianghu spirit, where one rolled with the punches. He had never been this open-minded before. Seeing Zhou Zixia live so honestly, actually made him faintly jealous. Zhou Zixia stayed on a flower lane roof for two days, completely downing about ten jars of wine, after which he finally managed to wait until the head scorpion brought out his entire flock of poisonous scorpions. Sure enough, villains had no hearts. That lame-legged evil ghost, who had tried to kill Zhang Chengling, had likely called for him to go fight along against Wen Kexing, then come back to deal with Zhao Jing. He had also deliberately made a lame-legged youth provoke Zhang Chengling, as if he was afraid that the boy wouldn't remember, or that Wen Kexing didn't know who was behind the long-tongued ghost. Both sides were collecting money and selling out, and after that, they still intended to take advantage of the devastation after their fierce battle to cook these people all together in one pot. It was really quite shrewd. Zhou Zixia was not in a rush. Extracting a human skin mask from his lapels, his handsome visage was gone without a trace via one swipe of his hand. He mixed into the crowd, tailing after them from a moderate distance. After following them for about three days, he noticed that they weren't going straight for Fenja Mountain, seeming to have actively taken a detour in the middle, as if they were specifically going to handle some kind of nuisance. Very quickly, he came to learn that this nuisance was actually Yu Kaiyu Feng. The man had previously exploited the green vixen in order to flee calamity, but he had no such good luck this time around. He was faced with a team of poisonous scorpions that was chasing him like cats hunting a mouse, and all he could do was desperately scramble away currently even more overwrought than Zhang Chengling. Now, he had no one protecting him there used to be a woman who might have done so, but she was dead. He wore only rags. There was not even an iota of sect leader Yu, who had grasped a lightly dancing fan. He was looking way more like a beggar than Zhou Zishu had when he first entered Jianghu. The Huashan sect had since re-established its leader, and no longer acknowledged him. He had become akin to a stray dog. Eventually, Yu Kaiyu Feng's route of escape reached its end, and he was captured alive before the head scorpion. End chapter Far Away Wanderers Chapter 69, Returning The scorpion used his toes to lift his chin, beginning to laugh. Oh oh oh, if it isn't sect leader Yu. Yu Kaiyu Feng shook all over. His eyes were dull, as if somewhat delirious. Struggling hard to raise his head, he looked at the scorpion. I... I'm not, not in my PL, not in my... He uttered, stopping and starting. The other shook his head, leaned in close, and spoke right into his ear. That night, outside of Lake Tai's Zhao Manor, there were actually a total of three people that had died. One was Mu Yunj. Duanjian Manor's owner. One was Yu Tianjia, your precious son. There's one more, that none of you knew, as he died in a cave. He was the long-tongued ghost of Ghost Valley. Do you want to hear about what happened with that, sect leader Yu? Once he brought up the name Yu Tianjia, Yu Kaiyu Feng resembled a quickly dying fish placed out of the water, twitching all over. The whites of his eyes were about to bulge out as he stared dead at the head scorpion. You had all known long ago about the Lapis Armor's existence before you went to Dongting, so you had your dear son wait at Lake Tai to intently watch the Zhang boy, and also take the chance to lie in wait for the armor. Unexpectedly. Mu Yunj, that nervous wreck, coincidentally discovered that the Zhao's had a piece, and used the night to steal it. Yu Tianjia had believed himself to have been the only one watching him, but in reality, that night, there were two others doing so as well. Yu Kaiyu Feng seemed to understand something, but also understand nothing. He felt that this was all getting absurd. It seemed like there was an unseen hand holding a plan in the dark, and each and every one of them was just an endlessly struggling pawn on an immense chi board. One was the delighted morning ghost. 
The reason why he hadn't the time to take the armor was because he sensed the presence of someone else, someone he couldn't provoke at the time the ghost of impermanence that represented the Ghost Valley's master, Meng Hui. Unluckily, he's also another client of mine. Your son, believing himself to be clever, stupidly took the armor off of Mu Yunge, and then, right as he excitedly thought to leave, Lao Meng had someone kill him. That someone had once been subordinated to Xue Fang, a general that later changed sides in Ghost Valley's internal strife the long-tongued ghost. The head scorpion paused. Tears evenly flowed down Yu Kai Yu Feng's wind-worn face, as did various unknown fluids, making him look both revolting and pitiful. What's even more unlucky is that the remarkable ghost master was meeting with his little paramour when the moon was above the branches of willows, so Lao Meng was too afraid to show his face. The traitorous long-tongued ghost used his old master's stunt to kill Yu Tianjia, then shift the blame for it, wanting to deliberately mislead the ghost master. Who'd have thought that the gentleman's pace would be too fast, so fast, the long-tongued ghost couldn't dodge in time, and thus, he boldly made use of his murderous aura, resulting in. The head scorpion gently laughed coldly, shoved Yu Kai Yu Feng away leaned askew against the back of a rattan chair that a poisonous scorpion had gotten from wherever, and sighed with quite a bit of lament. What type of person is the most tragic? Those who don't know their own weights, rashly entertaining high aspirations. Sect leader you, do you know what's different between the heart grown in your chest, and the heart grown in mine? He lightly patted his own chest, looking at the man with a set up on high pity, and shook his head. The one I grew is a heart of ambition. The one you grew, is a heart of wishful thinking. Yu Kai Yu Feng's expression cleared up a bit, and he suddenly spoke up with a mosquito-like voice. I, Daoist Huang, Feng Xiao Feng, every one of us, the vague information we received before, had actually been all you, all you. An aloof smile appeared on the other's face. That's right. How difficult it is. Lao Meng is my client, wanting to utilize me to silently kill. Zhao Jing is my client, wanting to utilize me to impede his partner, Lao Meng. Sun Ding is my client, too, wanting to utilize me to fabricate a bunch of falsehoods, frame Xue Fang whose whereabouts are still unknown for the things he had done, and thus eliminate his enemies using the valley's rules and the ghost master's hands, as for me. I was originally a businessman that relied on killing people and selling things to grow my enterprise. If one can't fish up some money in troubled waters, how could they be worthy of the title of Poisonous Scorpion? Wouldn't you agree, sect leader Yu? He shook his head, then stood. An underling immediately stepped forth and draped a large cloak over the scorpion, who no longer looked at Yu Kai Yu Feng. Four Seasons Manor has lied low for over ten years. I heard that it was playing lackey for the dynasty. Ha, what are they, even? This martial forest is now in the palm of my hand, you're really lucky, sect leader you, to be able to come across me when things have gotten to this extent. What a shame that I can't give any mercy, as Lao Meng and Zhao Jing have both told me to get rid of you. I really can't bear it, ah, but what's to be done? All I can do is try my best to make you an understanding ghost. No need to feel grateful. Once he was finished speaking, he had since walked quite far away, the poisonous scorpions immediately following after him. At that time, Yu Kai Yu Feng's whole body jolted, and he lowered his head a scorpion's hook had penetrated his back, pierced through his body, came through to the front of his chest, and jabbed apart his ragged shirt, exposing a blue-tinged tip. Acute pain enshrouding him, he hissed and shrieked. The scorpion restraining him expressionlessly drew the hook out, a large amount of flesh and blood flying out with it, and then, without looking at him, turned to follow his companions. Yu Kai Yu Feng spasmed all over. He knew that he was going to die. Never before in his life had he been so hopeless. The sensation of sharp pain slowly dulled, numbing at first then spreading cold throughout his body. He fought to keep his eyes wide, but his vision continued to fade, as if there was an irresistible force pulling him downwards. His hand unconsciously gripped the grass growing on the ground, 
pulling it up by the roots in his convulsion-like grip. All of a sudden, he saw a pair of shoes stop before his eyes. He tried hard to raise his head, but couldn't clearly see who it was. Several broken sounds came from his mouth, help, help, help. That someone seemed to crouch down next to him. Level waters green the color of the willows, the other said. The moon and the flowers keep distant mutual watch. Year upon year upon age upon age, every time, every time, what? Those few, understated verses were like thunder, instantly exploding in his ears. At a loss, he looked up, but still couldn't see their appearance clearly. As if hallucinating, he couldn't even say whether they were male or female, only vaguely recalling, that there had been a giggling maiden, who loved to wear green. Lu Jianxiao. Such a hard-to-look-at woman. Why had she gotten high hopes with him? She'd been a fool. One fan, and one verse, had been enough to make her dead set. Every time, the ice vanishes later. Those phrases, long forgotten and once recited casually, were suddenly awakened from his memory in this instant of intersection between life and death. Several times, the blue sea is calm. Mountain snow, is separated from cloudy peaks. One glance, one glance sees infinite youth. Only this, this heart, is so, old. One glance sees infinite youth, only this heart is so old. He had blurted that out. She had kept it in mind unto death. All his life, he calculated against others, and others calculated against him. Only one such woman had treated him sincerely missed, then gone. Yu Kaiyu Feng's slightly parting lips finally stopped moving. Hand clutching the mudded grass, his eyes looked blankly to one side, pupils unfocused they bore his pledge of eternal love of questionable validity, and reflected a road that was infinitely dark, sinister, and cold. Dust returned to dust. Earth returned to earth. Zhou Zisha crouched beside him for a time, looking down as if in deep thought, then sighed, reaching out to close his eyes. Thanks for letting me know, he said, not very sincerely. He stood, and followed the scorpion's trail. Zhao Jing amassed heroes of all sorts in the central plains, about to strike Fenja Mountain in the name of rectifying the righteous path, taking revenge and eliminating grudges. The oath of no one comes in, no one comes out from thirty years prior was already broken. In this world, where evildoers were to all be thrown out, a thorough purge would begin. Simultaneously, a figure that had not been in anyone's view for a very long time arrived at Fenja Mountain. The mountain was as tall as a thousand blades. Surrounded on all sides, Green Bamboo Ridge was in its middle. It was the midst of early summer, where plants were just starting to flourish, and birds were going on riots. A small path wound straight into the valley. Were it not for the gigantic sign saying those with souls, do not pass, it would resemble a paradise of gorgeous scenery. This was Ghost Valley. A tall figure appeared beside the giant stone signboard. Tilting his head back to view it for a minute, the faint trace of a smile suffused his face. This was Wen Kexing. He himself wasn't even sure what route he had taken, to have reached the valley a step ahead of everyone else. He was leading a straight black horse along, the beast seemed to have intelligence pacing fretfully near the sign like it was unwilling to enter. He smiled, reaching out to pet its face. He took off both its bridle and saddle, then patted on its body. Go on. In a human-like way, the horse blinked its big eyes as it watched him for a time. After trotting a few steps away, it looked back at the man, as if somewhat reluctant to part from him. Upon witnessing him wave at it, it sped off in large strides. When Kexing stood in place for a second. Those with souls, do not pass, he sneered. With a raise of his hand, there seemed to be a strong gust wrapped inside his sleeve as he harshly swiped the stone sign, thus erasing three-fourths of its words with a bang. Debris fell down in succession. That enormous sound barged into the valley as it was carried along with the wind, reverberating non-stop. Shortly after, a grey silhouette appeared out of thin air. The shouts coming from his mouth were extremely sharp, 
like pieces of iron slashing against each other, and hearing them could give one goosebumps. Who dares to trespass? His subsequent words got stuck in his throat, that grey shadow halting three Zhang away from Wen Kexing. After getting a good look at who had come, an indescribable, utterly fearful expression appeared on him in an instant, gurgling sounds coming out of his larynx. He almost couldn't form any sounds. VVV, Valley Master. Quickly reacting, he knelt onto the ground with a plop, then buried his head down low, as if he was soon about to be buried, period. Respectful greetings to you, Valley Master, he trembled out. Wen Kexing didn't even glance at him. Have Lao Meng and Sun Ding come back yet, he asked, indifferent. Tell them to come and see me. Not waiting for the minor ghost to answer him, he passed right by him. The grey-clothed man nevertheless seemed to have just endured a life-and-death catastrophe, it wasn't until the other had gone far away that he shakily looked up, his entire back already soaked with cold sweat. Slowly, he betrayed a hateful expression, stood up, and soundlessly slipped into the woods. Ghost Valley's master that was a genuine lunatic, a real evil demon. His moods fluctuated, where one moment, he would be chatting with someone, all smiles, and the next, he might have snatched the other's head. Apart from Purple Fury, who he had raised since childhood, no one else dared to make too loud of a noise before him, since he was a lunatic. He loved nothing, and appeared to have no desires. His entire being was akin to a machine that could only massacre. No one could bribe him. No one knew what he was thinking. No one knew what he wanted. No one knew when he would create disasters. No one knew how to avoid his blows. Outsiders doesn't know a thing, but this place was the land of evil ghosts. No morality, no humanity. The weak were only meat for the strong to feast upon and he was strong, so he could do whatever he wanted. Even if he was just standing around to survey the land, jabbering about household matters, he would still make people act like they were facing a huge enemy. That was because, in general, wolves would not have the patience to jabber with rabbits. Yet, even if this madman didn't look like a human, he still was one. The grey-clothed ghost's eyes flashed the madman had just walked himself into a dead end, but he didn't even know it. After less than three-quarter hours of time, Lao Meng hurried to Yamaha. There was nobody else idly waiting within it aside from Wen Kexing, as well as the unfamiliar maid standing beside him. The man had already changed out of his travel-dirted clothes, now wrapped in dark, long robes, and was seated languidly atop a spacious chair. His hair was loose, as if it had just been washed. The maid was cautiously combing it. Less than half of his face was concealed beneath his crow-black hair, but the corners of his mouth still held a smile, crimson, and those robes had been hastily tied with a dark red belt. His whole body gave off a bit of a ghastly aura. Lao Meng worked him out in his head. He knew himself to have the upper hand, but upon seeing how he was, a chill seeped through his bones, for some reason. Barely able to settle his emotions, he knelt deferentially, then lowered his eyes to avoid Wen Kexing's gaze. Respectful greetings to you, Valley Master. End chapter